Item number 15 is an ordinance amending the land use categories in Chapter 35 of the City's Unified Development Code to implement the SA Tomorrow Comprehensive Plan. Councilwoman Vigran. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think there's a presentation. Rudy, if you could please give that. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, the next item is consideration of proposed amendments to two sections of the Unified Development Code, as detailed in your packet. Uh, this item was first considered at your June 21st public hearing, but was tabled at the request of Council to conduct further, a further round of public outreach, which the, which the Department completed in the, uh, the summer of this year. As part of my presentation, I'll include details of the staff proposal uh, as presented to the community in open forums, as well as an outline of the full public engagement effort. Uh, first, I would like to begin with a primer on what SA Tomorrow is and how it's being implemented in the community. Uh, the comprehensive plan is the city's land use and urban planning policy. The plan details how and where the city should aggregate future growth. Using data related to existing job centers, we were able to identify where future job and housing options should go in order to capitalize on investments by both the public and the private sectors. Additionally, the plan also recommends the development of community plans to provide a land use plan and map for the balance of the city. These areas uh, partner neighborhoods that have similar characteristics such as time of development, number of neighborhoods, and similar challenges and opportunities. Uh, it should be noted that community areas are not intended to specifically accommodate significant amounts of future growth. The idea behind these plans is to ensure that we have addressed land use, mobility, and infrastructure requirements, for example, uh, for these areas at a community scale and to have more co a comprehensive assessment and guidance for future improvements and bond projects. The planning department will utilize existing plans as a critical baseline for the development of modern plans that address land use at the community scale, but also support neighborhood conservation and promote local priorities. The council directed the department to initiate the regional center plans within a three-year work plan and the balance of the sub-area plans within five years. Then the department will take the critical next steps related to implementing the plan so that they do not sit in the shelf. This slide details what a land use plan is. In summation, the city's land use policy for a specific area that details how the area will grow and develop, what pattern that growth should take, and recommends an actionable plan to implement the land use recommendations. In short, land use is intended to provide cohesive districts with compatible uses. However, it should also be noted that a land use plan is much more than a map. It defines a future for a community through policies as well. These policies and the land use map together are guiding principles for decisions related to the land use planning and future investments in a community. Uh, these decisions are made by the development-related boards and commissions of the city, as well as you, the city council. Having said all of this, a part of implementing the comprehensive plan and to better develop modern, more comprehensive sub-area plans, the department is now proposing to update the land use categories in the Unified Development Code to ensure that we have a clear, concise set of land use categories that will guide our city into the future while addressing long-standing needs in our community. Through the years and based on the comprehensive plan adopted in the 1970s and updated in, the in 1999, the city implemented a series of neighborhood and community plans to guide growth and development. Over 40 plans in all, the city has yet to enjoy a land use map for all of San Antonio. And this fact remains even after almost 40 years. Each of these plans has their own set of discrete land use categories, yet most differ from those categories in neighboring plans setting the community up for a disjointed land use pattern and unfortunately disallowing in many cases opportunity and choice in some areas of our community. SA Tomorrow recommends an approach where opportunity and choice related to future land use is available to all areas of our community. Choice for folks that have fewer options, thus addressing community equity, and access to the services that are needed no matter where you live in the city. The proposed amendments would take the city from the current set of over 50 categories to a harmonious set of clearly defined categories that address the city's future land use needs. On the screen now, you can see the community engagement effort that was conducted to get to this point in the process. From focus group meetings, to city-wide meetings with residents, to outreach with organizations like SAGE, to engagement with staff in your offices at a number of key points in the process. 
Additionally, the Comprehensive Plan Committee forwarded these amendments back to the City Council following a series of community meetings that were conducted by the local chapter of the American Institute of Architects. I would like to thank uh, the AIA and we uh, state that we appreciate the effort of the AIA architects in that process. On the screen now, you can see the timeline of the formal adoption process, which included a number of briefings to committees uh, and consideration by both the Planning Commission's Technical Advisory Committee, as well as the full Planning Commission and the Zoning Commission. Both of these city commissions recommended approval to the City Council with a unanimous vote. The two matrices on the screen detail just one example of the inconsistency between two neighboring plan areas. Uh, these matrices highlight the lack of overall consistency and the potential for a future land use pattern that does not uh, provide the city with an efficient nor effective use of our land. This next slide now shows the full list of proposed land use categories. Of note is the addition of the urban low density residential land use category. Uh, this proposed category represents an addition to staff's initial proposal as recommended by attendees of a meeting with the Tier 1 neighborhood group on December 18, 2017. Additionally, the proposal includes a more nuanced approach to mixed uses uh, to include a new business innovation mixed use category that would permit live work opportunities near future business parks and innovation and technology centers. Additionally, the residential land use categories are also proposed for an update to reflect an updated approach to residential density in the city. While developing this proposal, it should be noted that the department conducted research into the most populous cities in the country and have similar, that have similar comprehensive plan policies related to growth allocation, leveraging transit investments, and other inputs. Uh, we looked into how our proposed categories related and where they also differed, basically doing a review of national best practices. We found that in, that in all, the proposal before you today is one that is on the lower end of the density spectrum when compared to other comparable cities. Yet, we, we still believe that these modest updates to our code will allow us to fulfill the SA tomorrow recommendations and believe that we can utilize these incremental changes to address our future land use needs and remain economically competitive. On this slide, you can see the track changes version for transparency. Making these revisions, as previously stated, we can eliminate some redundancies and provide for more opportunity, choice, and flexibility in terms of land use in our community. Uh, with that, staff recommends approval of the proposed staff recommendation as provided to the council in your packet. You also have a copy of that proposal um, at, the, uh, at your seats. Um, this concludes my formal presentation. I thank you for your kind attention. Um, I will be available for your questions following your citizen comments. Thank you, Rudy. Um, Councilman, we have several citizens signed up to speak on this item. I'll call them now. We'll begin with Ross Lawhead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had Mr. Bruce Mary with me, and he did sign in, but he had to leave for a funeral. I don't know if I can have his three minutes or not. You can rule on that. My name is Ross Lawhead. I am the volunteer um, land use attorney for the Oakland Estates Neighborhood Association in District 8, and I reside at 5975 Lock Hill Road. San Antonio, Texas. Um, I'm here to speak about the land use uh, category definition adjustments. I have a couple of concerns about it. One is a general concern that all this is being used to drive density, and it's being used to drive density only in neighborhoods that don't benefit from having restrictive covenants that prevent it, and I don't like that about it. I know that council is headed this way anyway. I have a couple of comments. Um, I don't like that the low density residential includes R4, which is 4,000 square foot lot, which is smaller than traditional city lots, but I understand that tier one wants it there, so I would ask the planning department to consider creating a suburban low density residential that does not include R4. I would also support what I've heard from tier one, which is the medium density residential should not include MF33, which is multifamily, which allows four-story apartment buildings. I think it really shows where this whole thing is heading when you call something medium density residential and it includes four-story apartment buildings. Um, that's my objection. I would now like to 
make an additional request related to this, which is the planning department has moved forward to make changes at the expense of neighborhood plans. And as you go forward and presumably approve these land use category changes, I would urge you to do a council consideration request to get strengthening neighborhood plans onto your agenda so that it can be addressed. Um, for residents of older neighborhoods not protected by restrictive covenants, the future land use plans in neighborhood plans are the only means for any input into the future land use in their neighborhoods. The citizen input processes for the development of these land use plans are exhausting and sometimes divisive. Redevelopment interests can buy a single lot and then get a seat at the table and seek to change an entire neighborhood. In this context, council members seek consensus but may eventually need to make hard decisions before these plans are approved by council. These decisions should not be excessively relitigated. San Antonio Tomorrow plans to eliminate neighborhood pl plan land use plans by rolling them into larger sub-area plans. One of my great concerns is that when a sub-area plan comes to council, you're going to pass it because it's so large, you're not going to reject it over the problems of an individual neighborhood. Planning says it will honor land use plans, but it intends to require them to be redone to remain effective. This is the problem. The planning process for citizen input is so exhausting, and you have literally hundreds of citizens that have put in hundreds of hours, and now we're basically looking at that being disrespected. Um, I have particularly looked at the existing UDC provisions that require five-year interval full process renewals of neighborhood plans. Uh, planning has not allocated sufficient resources to support this requirement, so they've let these neighborhood plans basically go to where they're not fully influential. But very recently, a temporary rule determination was made to protect them in the interim, led in fact by development services, but acquiesced in by planning. My problem is nothing legally enforceable requires planning to retain neighborhood-based local control over the citizen input process for future land use plan development, revision, or renewal. So, for example, I'm in Oakland Estates. We know what we want in Oakland Estates. We have a land use plan. We had to fight for it a great deal with the planning department, but we have it. But if later on this just gets rolled up into a sub-area plan, there's nothing committing the planning department to use Oakland Estates residents to plan Oakland Estates land use. We could be simply one person on a committee of 10 over a larger area. They are not locked in, there's too much discretion, and they've blown away the little influence we have by putting neighborhood plans in play. Oakland Estates has drafted a proposed ordinance to solve these matters. Uh, part of that's on there. If I could ask you, sir, to shove it up a little because the part at the top is less relevant. Key elements of this ordinance are to roll forward the current land use plans into SA tomorrow without the gating requirement of these exhausting renewals to make plan renewals at the discretion of the planning department. They still have the power to come in if they're rolled forward. But you need to understand the way it's written right now, any developer can require a wholesale plan renewal. All they've got to do is buy one piece of property or put it under option in my neighborhood and then they can require us to go through this exhausting process. They don't need that power because they already have a parallel power when they want to rezone. They can actually get a concurrent process before the planning commission for a spot plan amendment so that they can do the rezoning. So if you give them the rezoning, they don't need this power. This is a separate power where they can force, I don't know, dozens of my neighbors to put in, I don't know, 50 or 100 hours over a period of six months to a year just to technically renew the neighborhood plan under the existing ordinance language, which is not proposed for amendment. I don't know if I had three or six. I'll conclude. Action should be, ta um, action should be taken now to protect neighborhood plans while planning is modifying the UDC because the neighborhoods are paying attention right now. You should respect the volunteer efforts, and we request a CCR, and I ask that Deputy City Manager Zamboni get involved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lawhead. Tony Garcia. Good morning, Mayor 
and uh, city council members. My name is Tony Garcia. I live at 243 East Wiesach in the Monta Vista Historic District. I'm a board member of the Monta Vista Historic Association. The association is also a member of the Tier 1 Neighborhood Coalition. I have a statement to read uh, on behalf of the association. The Monta Vista Historical Association agrees that San Antonio's future land use categories will help create a more consistent, predictable, and defined classification than what is currently found under the UDC. The association further agrees that these future land use categories will help address inconsistent categories found in many of San Antonio's outdated neighborhood plans. With the above understanding, the association does hope the city of San Antonio will not discard our 1988 neighborhood plan, but update and make it an integral part of the sub-area land use discussions within the SA Tomorrow process. The Monte Vista Historical Association supports the future land use categories being proposed by the city of San, Anto San Antonio. Furthermore, the association strongly supports the amendments being proposed by District 1 office as it further refines the future land use ca categories while maintaining the residential character of Monte Vista Historic District and many other inner city neighborhoods. These amendments are based on community input, including that of the Monte Vista Historical Association. We therefore request your serious consideration of these amendments to the future land use classifications. Yours in community, Melody Hall, president of the Monte Vista Historical Association. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Philip Mana. Good day. Uh, my name is Philip Mana. I live at 9525 Rochelle. I am the president of the Alamo Farmsteads Neighborhood Association, and I was the planning chair of the Hebner Leon Creeks Community Plan. And for the last three years, I've been one of the few community members on the City of San Antonio Planning Commission Technical Advisory Committee. There's a large cadre of well-funded full-time developers and their support teams that uh, look to maximize their potential return on development opportunities, sometimes at the detriment of uh, existing communities supported by ill-funded part-time uh, volunteers um, that are neighbors that are trying to protect their communities. Uh, the primary tool used uh, for the growing city between communities and developers uh, are uh, communication, there is communication. And fortunately, the city has provided a lot of good tools for this, which includes um, the community plans, neighborhood plans, community zoning commissions, and the UDC. And each of these avenues allows for input and feedback on how developers must engage within communities. Uh, the Heener uh, Leon Creek Community Plan was one of the first to be approved by the city in 2003. Uh, since then, many plans have been created within the communities uh, that have leveraged the existing um, um, UDC, which includes those defined within low density and medium density residential. I do not agree with the council should uh, be approving the change to the UDC specific to the R4 residential zoning district from medium density to low density classification. Over the last 20 years, I've spent a lot of time working with developers seeking denser infill development in our community. By moving the R4 zoning from median density to low density, removes one of those communication points required by the developers seeking denser infill into our low density communities. Um, we're not against density, and you know, we just want to ensure that there's community engagement. And this week we had an encouraging dialogue from District 7 office that engaged with, our, with a developer to bring in a more dense community into actually an existing um, um, low density development and it's, it seems like it's going to work through very well. So, so, it's, so you know, it's good to have those dialogues that are provided through these, uh, these uh, rules that are kind of set in place. Um, and so overall, you know, it's just not for that. The same dialogue was said about the MF, moving the MF33 from the high density to medium density. A second observation is the current UDC proposal is a naming convention in the zoning category of urban low density residential, which I believe is misleading and should be renamed to urban medium density residential because it more closely aligns with the other categories that are uh, the other zoning districts that are within those uh, within the low density versus the medium density. Um, so by doing so, the future uh, it allows for the future dialogue again uh, for community with those developers. And finally, as a general comment. Yeah, I think anything that we do that in the UDC that um, 
potentially diminishes the strength and validity of existing community neighborhood plans is detrimental really to the city of San Antonio. Hundreds of hours have been spent, and so I'd just like to respect those hours spent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manna. Cynthia Spielman. Good morning, my name's Cynthia Spillman. I live at 900 West Woodlawn and I'm a resident of District 1. I'm also on the board of the Beacon Hill Area Neighborhood Association and steering member of Tier 1 Neighborhood Coalition. Dear Mayor and Council Members, Beacon Hill Neighborhood has dealt with much of the tensions and stress that many downtown area neighborhoods have felt regarding incompatible development and inconsistent zoning changes. Land use is an important tool to help create consistency for not only developers, but the neighbors that live with the developments. We've worked with other neighborhoods through our membership in Tier 1 Neighborhood Coalition for months, as well as attended numerous city and AIA meetings to advocate changes to the flu proposal that make it more balanced and thoughtful for advocating for the changes of category for MF33, MF25, and RM4, for example. We, and as we create new sub-area plans and see development incentives through IDZ, CHIP, and fee waiver program changes, as well as possible by right zoning to benefit housing, there has to be a structure in place that guides us in the future as we accommodate change that helps maintain resilient neighborhoods instead of destroying them. If implemented correctly, neighborhoods will be able to create land use plans for their community and future zoning changes will be dependent on those plans. Several incompatible developments in neighborhoods that exist now would not have been possible without a planning change if the flu proposals had already been adopted. The flu changes with our recommended amendments help us maintain neighborhood character while accommodating future development. Please support the future land use changes, including the amendments from District 1 that have, incorporate, that have incorporated feedback from San Antonio neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Spielman. Colin Jones. Uh, good morning. My name is Colin Jones. I live at 1123 Nolan, San Antonio, Texas. I'm going to uh, be reading a letter here on behalf of Tier 1 Steering Committee. Uh, Mayor. Uh, Tier 1 Neighborhood Coalition is a coalition of over 50 interloop 410 neighborhoods that encompass all but three council districts. While no one can represent that many different entities without a vote, our steering committee of nine comes from the far, excuse me, from the four parts of the inner city, and we ask city council today to support the proposed future land use plan. We proposed, excuse me, we held a well-attended public workshop at San Antonio College on the future land use changes, as well as countless smaller meetings with different neighborhood stakeholders, worked on issues over the last several months to suggest balance changes in the proposal, and help create an effective tool to plan for the future as we participate in the SA Tomorrow comprehensive sub-area planning. We worked with individual neighborhoods and more local coalitions to help produce changes we hope will guide the future of our communities while protecting and preserving what is best about us. No document is perfect, and so much depends on our trust in the city to work in good faith with its residents, but the future land use changes will give structure to an unwieldy land use, which we hope will help us all make sound decisions about our future. Tier 1 Neighborhood Coalition Steering Committee, Cosa McAlvin, Christine Drennan, Tony Garcia, Homer Hayes, myself, Ricky Kushner, Velma Pena, Cynthia Spielman, and Teresa Ibanez. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Velma Pena. Good morning, council members, Mayor Nuremberg. My name is Amelia, and I reside at 1635 Potosi. I'm the president of the historic Westside Resident Association. Good morning. My name is Velma Pena. Uh, I am the president of the Westwood Square Neighborhood Association, as well as the Westside Neighborhood Association's coalition. I live at 1208 Penn. <clears throat> the future land use changes give structure to progress in our neighborhood so that residents and developers know the rules. We're seeing our neighborhoods destroyed, one case at a time, especially what happened yesterday at 1201 Montezuma. We want progress and revitalization 
for the residents who live here. Councilwoman Gonzalez, please continue to preserve our community and work for the betterment of us all by endorsing this plan. Council members, please support the flu as we move into the future, especially the amendments proposed by District 1. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pena. Mary Johnson. Mary Johnson. Ann Engelhart. I'm sorry, Ann Englert. Thank you. My name is Ann Englert, and I live at 331 Mink in Delview. And um, yesterday it became apparent that many of us needed to step forward. So I prepared a letter, and I was able to send that to all of y'all in the wee hours before going to bed at midnight. And I'm writing to ask you to support the land use changes that have been incorporated with the feedback from the San Antonio neighbors. Much work in the Dedication from my contemporaries have gone into developing these plans to protect current and future neighborhood developments to be used and be meaningful to our beloved and unique neighborhoods as well as allow for growth and density. And you've already heard from Cynthia and others today about Beacon Hill and it's just imperative that I feel that we have something that's consistent going forward because if, if we don't have it then we've, we've got opportunities where neighborhoods are going to be left behind, but more importantly, the voices of the residents will be too. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Englert. Councilwoman Villagran. Thank you, Mayor, and I want to thank everyone for coming out and um, all of the letters and everything that has been shared and communicated with our offices. Um, because this is very important. This is a very important step that we're taking right now, and it um, involves thorough and transparent um, communication and process as we move forward. I know uh, back in June this was moving forward on the council agenda, but um, we move forward with a, con a continuance to continue to have public input into this process. And the public input has been happening. So Rudy, I have some questions for you right now. Can you please... Um, on, uh, so the CPC on August 15th, the process was again, so in June 21st, the process was first paused to have more um, community inputs in order to re-engage our communities. As some district's residents needed more time to get a better understanding of the ordinance as we were amending the land use categories um, to Im implement this SA Tomorrow comprehensive plan. And um, then further on August 15th, the process was again paused so AIA could come in and do some meetings before returning to full council today. And what feedback did the planning department receive from those AIA meetings? Um, specifically related to the AIA meetings, the planning department didn't receive any direct feedback about those. Um, we did receive feedback from one of the architects that participated in the process related to his specific uh, presentation. That was Mario Pena, and we appreciated that related to his equity presentation, but nothing specific related to land use, ma'am. Okay. And the reason that the council public hearing on the 21st was paused is because staff we requested that staff hold more community meetings and from what I understand obviously those meetings were held and what were those meetings what were the takeaways from those community meetings uh, that's a great question councilwoman actually um, the takeaways were uh, relatively split uh, from the community members. Uh, we had over 120 folks participate uh, in the process and participate in those community meetings. Um, we received uh, 78 comment cards back from folks who wanted to actually write out what their concerns were or, or their support um, with a total of 91 individual comments. And from all of the feedback that we received, it was fairly evident that it was split down the middle. Uh, there were about half the folks thought that uh, we weren't providing enough opportunity uh, for more density or enough opportunity for more choice uh, when it came to land use. Uh, and the other half thought that maybe there was uh, too much emphasis on, on density. So it was split down the middle, which made us uh, feel even more comfortable that we're, we're providing a, um, a moderate proposal uh, forward to council. All right. Thank you. 
And um, from what was originally presented in June, what has changed because of those, those meetings? What did y'all uh, change? Mm -hmm. Um, well, in terms of modifications to staff's recommendation, sure. again, the, the uh, interaction that we had with folks and the takeaways that we had from those community meetings was that the, the recommendation was sound. And so we wanted to proceed forward with a recommendation uh, that you all have in front of you all today, um, a recommendation that provided that, that flexibility. Uh, it was one that has gone through the entire public engagement process. Modifications have been made. Uh, throughout this process. Um, an example would be uh, following a key point in the process where we had our citywide community meetings. It was fairly evident that there was uh, some work that needed to be done with the RM4 uh, mixed residential district. And since we heard that not just from individual residents, but also from, from some staff members within your offices, uh, we thought it prudent to remove it and to make the modifications between now and the 2020 amendment process, and then, and then bring it back forward so that it can be utilized uh, well and incorporated into the land use framework. And, the, and on the SA Tomorrow comprehensive plan, we are going to have a five-year review. Correct. So, um, so when we move forward, there's always, this is gonna be a dynamic plan where we're going to be able to review it and go through a community outreach process again. And my understanding is in 2019, we're going to open up that uh, review again. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, a, there's two things that will actually be occurring over the course of the next few, uh, couple of years. The first one, you're correct, would be the Unified Development Code Amendments that would be uh, forwarded to the City Council in 2020. Uh, the Planning Department, as, uh, through uh, funding that was dedicated from the Council, uh, will be conducting a Unified Development Code assessment. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, hire a third-party consultant to look at the comprehensive plan and the goals and policies therein, to look at the Unified Development Code and to see what, can, what do we need to modify in order to make sure that we're actually implementing those goals and policies. Um, additionally, the planning department also will be providing to the City Council following a five-year process a, um, a status report on where are we actually in implementing the comprehensive plan. So you, the Council will have those two opportunities to provide uh, guidance one on the development code and then number two on the on the policies that are in the plan itself and I need clarification what we're moving forward with right now is is not about that whole IDZ category that is correct ma'am that is still something that we need to talk about later yes ma'am as I understand it there is a, a completely separate process a CCR process that is being driven by the development services department uh, to provide uh, IDZ reform uh, and recommendations about IDZ uh, that is not part of what this proposal would would entail Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think as was mentioned in many of the statements here, we are a very different community, and I think we took a bold step to have a comprehensive plan, the SA Tomorrow plan for San Antonio, because we wanted that guidance and we wanted that um, clarification. And as it was mentioned, safeguarding for our neighborhoods and our communities, as many of our neighborhoods and communities are going through transitions. And as was mentioned too, there are a lot of inconsistencies in myself and in my district. We've had to initiate CCRs to do different items for um, land use, et cetera. But like I mentioned earlier, pausing the June 21st council meeting was to re-engage the community and we have done that and to make sure that we continue to reach out and try and answer those pending questions to the changes in the land use categories. Now I also understand that what we have here presented today, the staff's recommendation, um, has that the Planning Commission's Technical Advisory Committee, the Planning Commission, and the Zoning Commission have been briefed on staff changes and all recommend approval. That is correct, ma'am. And I want to make sure that we follow this process. And, um, and I thank my council colleagues for this continued vetting of this, and that's why um, we're, we're here today. But I also want to make sure that I know that you all have, and we have received just yesterday, the council members, um, two amendments to this. And um, if we're talking about process and we're talking about transparency and true, I would like to have more vetting of that. So to put this forward in this time and place, um, I don't think I could speak to that as being the proper and true process that we needed to go through. So I'm not saying that I would, I'm against the MF25 
or the medium density, but we haven't gone through the appropriate process and vetting that I think we needed to do in that instead of getting it the day before. And to be faithful to all of the citizens of San Antonio because it would impact all of the citizens in San Antonio. And you all know, because I've shared it last time, um, the Brooks Regional Center has been waiting to move forward, and that's on the south side of San Antonio. But because of the delay, we've had to wait on this as well. Um, but I know that if needs to be, if need to be, um, my, my colleagues, just like they did with the IDZ, um, you know, IDZ changes and investigations, that could happen through a CCR as well. So um, with that, Mayor, at this time, I would like to move forward and make a motion to approve staff's recommendation on adopting the proposed amendments to Chapter 35, Unified Development Code. Okay, there's a motion and a second for approval of item number 15. And we have uh, many, many of our colleagues signed up to speak, so we'll go ahead and start with uh, Councilman Trevino. Thank you, Mayor, um, and I had hoped to pull this item to offer an amendment uh, to this item based on the thorough evaluation uh, by myself and my District 1 staff along with uh, planning and the District 1 and Tier 1 neighborhoods. Uh, really, this is about the character of their communities. And uh, first, I just simply say, look, I, I, uh, Rudy and Bridget and the entire planning department, I appreciate all your hard work. This is, this is a tremendous amount of work. Um, you know, what, we, what we're simply saying is that there's, there's pieces of this that uh, I think we've been fairly consistent about in, in what, what we're trying to accomplish. And at the heart of that is protecting the character and, and spirit of neighborhoods, uh, as you heard earlier. Uh, first, I'd like to submit uh, all the letters uh, received uh, on behalf of neighborhoods uh, in District 1 and Tier 1 and beyond. Uh, for the record, um, <clears throat> before I go there, I also want to thank Chrissy for all her hard work on this. Uh, you know, you've really uh, uh, gone above and beyond to make sure that that the neighborhoods have, are, are being being heard, and uh, we want to to protect our neighborhood characters. And that is not a new thing. That is not something that we just brought up. Um, you know, what we're simply saying is that there are some things we're experiencing and we've been trying to address those and it was indicated from your office that we'd have to make this as in form of an amendment. So we're going to do that. Um, I want to point out that, um, you know, we have looked at these and how the categories have been applied and have, how they compare to uh, those draft maps outside of our district and we have noticed there's a clear trend in the application of the categories. Uh, the medium density category is being applied to neighborhoods that have smaller parcels and therefore higher levels of density or perhaps a history of established duplexes in the area, but which have only residential uses for large areas. We have also reviewed all, the all 19 of our existing neighborhood and, and sector plans, none of which include MF33 in the medium density residential category most of which are capped at the category of MF18. Uh, the corridors uh, where we would hope to see the large multifamily complexes such as MF33 and above are being designated mixed use, not medium density residential because these projects areas for apartments are next to offices, commercial spaces and services. The neighborhood mixed use category which has been applied to our corridors is currently capped at MF18 density. Our proposal is to even those two out. And as they are adjacent to each other and allow uh, for more density on the corridors and not allow high density apartments inside of neighborhoods, and I want to be clear about what I'm saying, because this is what's happening. It didn't happen yesterday. It's happening, in fact, since day one I've been on this council. That's almost four years now. And that is we're seeing incompatible developments in the middle of a block splitting neighborhoods. That's a real thing. And, uh, you know, we're, we, we have filed many CCRs to try to deal with this. Uh, and uh, we know that it's not going to be a silver bullet. We know it's, it's going to take these kinds of motions where we're, where we're adjusting a little piece of, of a much bigger plan, which, again, I want to stress that I realize that this is a big 
plan and there's a lot of work that's gone into it by planning, so we certainly appreciate that. We're simply asking for some consideration. Uh, we've distributed to my council colleagues a comparison of what MF33 and MF25 look like when built to capacity in terms of height and density, which I hope will illustrate why we're proposing these changes. Again, I want to point out, um, this is about timing, and part of it is the fact that th this is part of the year one implementation, and, and we, wanna, we want to uh, use every tool that's available to us to, to address the concerns that, that are affecting our neighborhoods. Uh, and one of those is basically, it's, it's a simple ask, it's the neighborhood plans, and I will continue to advocate for neighborhood plans. I will continue to advocate for uh, a, a way to make sure that the character of neighborhoods are protected, are, are considered as part of our planning process, they're thoughtful, and they're the reason that the city has the character it has. And so, therefore, I, I move to amend land use categories by removing MF33 from the medium density residential category and adding MF25 to the category to the neighborhood mixed use category. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, there's a motion and a second uh, for an amendment as read by Councilman Trevino to item number, um, item number 15. And so as we proceed through the remainder of the discussion, um, I will ask my colleagues to contain their comments to the amendment. We'll take up the motion on the amendment and then we'll move forward with the main item uh, and the main motion. Um, so we'll start with Councilman Perry. Thank you, sir. Um, it's already been discussed about the, the process, and we have gone through a lengthy process. If you can pull up slide five. I mean, that, that uh, kind of tells a story there in the next uh, slide six. We do have a process here, and there's been plenty of opportunities to make changes along the way, and I understand that uh, uh, this is a, f a flexible plan that additional changes can be made in the future, and they, pr they probably will be. Uh, but I can just look at uh, both the, the communities, the neighborhoods, as well as industry has had uh, ample opportunity. I mean, when did we actually start this process? How long ago? This process actually started approximately one year ago. About a year ago. Yes, so sir. we've had about a year and, and a lot of meetings, a lot of manpower, a lot of hours that uh, has gone into this, this process and this, this product that the staff is making a recommendation today to, to pass. And I, we've received a letter from REXA. We've uh, just received notification from the Apartment Association that they support uh, what is being offered today because they were a part of that process. They just got this change or recommended change yesterday. And that's very unfair for all the players in this process to make a decision or try to review and get everybody to sit down around a table again to make a change in something that's taken over a year to put together. So I'll be supporting the staff recommendation and, and if there's some fatal flaws in this, what can ha do we, we don't have to wait for the next major review of this, right? I mean, a CCR could be submitted today if there were fa uh, fatal flaws or through the process, if we find that there are complications that need to be addressed, um, when council adopted the comprehensive plan, um, part of that ordinance also provides for the planning department to submit um, uh, implementation amendments in order to, to continue through the process. And so uh, should we find that there are those issues, we actually can submit to council an amendment. So there, there's, there's a process yes, that changes can be made that again gets everybody around the table to have an opportunity to review and make comments and agree or agree to disagree or whatever uh, to get to that final product again. Agreed. Okay, great. Well, again, I, um, I'll be supporting uh, 
uh, the staff recommendation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councilman Perry. Councilman Courage. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and looking at this timeline, this process that we have up here, um, were you at most of these meetings yourself? Uh, yes, sir. I presented at the vast majority of these meetings. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, the particular issues that are brought up today by Councilman Trevino, the MF33 and MF25 uh, redesignation in, in different areas than you're recommending, were those issues brought up and discussed early in the process, the beginning of the process, all through the process, or did they just come up at the end of this process? Through the process that has been laid out on, on, the, on the slide five and slide six, we understand that there were some neighborhoods that had some concern related to MF33 within the medium density residential. Uh, having said that, and that we heard that probably through about the middle point of the process. Okay. Um, we had those meetings, we had those discussions, and we made it very clear that that staff's professional opinion and uh, and given the balanced opinion that we're hearing from other folks within the community, you know we. We heard their concerns, uh, so just just because we don't necessarily agree didn't mean that we didn't actually hear them out. We heard them. Uh, we believe that um, they are valid, and that through the community planning process, that we'll, we will work to ensure that neighborhood character and the, and, and uh, community protection are taken into consideration. Um, in terms of the amendments that have been proposed and are on the floor following Councilwoman Villagran's amendment, uh, we didn't know about those until Monday, specifically. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, I understand with MF33, one of the things that was mentioned to me that uh, someone could want to rezone uh, a residential property in the middle of a neighborhood uh, to MF33, and that would allow them to build a four-story apartment complex there? Well, um, given the way that the process works, they can actually do that today. At the end of the day, an applicant can always submit an amendment to any plan, and they can submit any sort of rezoning case that they would like. Um, through this process, what we're proposing is that we are updating all of these land use plans, so they will all have, number one, updated land use categories, but also updated policies. So, for instance, while it may not necessarily directly speak to the issue of, um, of MF33 within, the, the, uh, within a particular block, uh, we can talk a little bit about the Oakland Estate situation because I know that, that was brought up earlier. Um, Prue Road is um, not necessarily a fully improved arterial roadway that's north of, of Oakland Estates. There has been concern about R4 uh, zoning permeating into the neighborhood given the fact that there is a low, uh, proposed, the proposed uh, low density residential category would include R4. Um, having said that, Part of the localized policy that can be de developed as part of the SA Tomorrow Plan, given that we have, we have been promoting this idea of flexibility within these plans, we can develop a policy that says within uh, the properties that are located along Prue Road, um, densities that are at R4 or greater are not recommended. Mm -hmm. And so that policy would, would essentially supersede the, the MAP uh, category because it will be a text uh, policy. Um, but again, any applicant at any time can request a plan amendment or a zoning change for any, any, any parcel within the city. That is part of their right as, as a property owner. Right. But if MF33 were not included in medium density, mm -hmm. then could someone go into an area and try and rezone it to MF33? Um, if they, it's a there, medium density area. There actually is a process for them to do that as well. Anyone can also um, submit a text amendment to a plan. So let's just say that MF33 were not included within the medium density residential category. Mm -hmm. Somebody can actually still, through the, through the plan amendment process, submit a text amendment and say, we want MF33 in these land use categories because we want to apply for a zoning change. And what would be the process to have that happen? They would have to submit an amendment, uh, an application for an amendment to the Development Services Department, right. and ultimately that request would still have to come to City Council. Uh, does it have to go through the community? Yes. Uh, well. There is, right now, there is no public participation requirement for the submittal of an application. So it's just like any other application, they would submit it to the Development Services Department, but the Development Services Department does notify the community. They notify registered neighborhood associations. Uh, when it comes to zoning changes, property owners within 200 feet all receive a notice. So there is a process that is laid out to make sure that the community is aware, as well as the, the new updated uh, signs that are provided to the community. And so, uh, 
and I'm just trying to understand if we yes, move sir. this out of this area, you know, mm -hmm. what the impact is. So you're saying that someone can still request to replan the neighborhood to allow uh, MF 33, but it's just a matter of they make the request, the city planning department handles it, they send out notices saying there's this request. They have to have public hearings? Absolutely. There has to be a public hearing that's involved with okay. any modification to a land use plan that's been adopted right. or to any zoning. And then if the planning commission approves that modification, then it still comes to council for it, its final It must still approval. come to council for consideration. And I would like to also point out that the, the construction of the land use categories and the recommended zoning districts that are attached to them do not necessarily reflect what uh, must be on the ground. If something were categorized as medium density residential, it doesn't have to be zoned uh, MF33. That is part of the reason why the planning department recommended and the council uh, approved um, the budget so that the planning department can take the next step in implementing these land use plans by rezoning properties so that if we're going to work with the community to develop these land use plans, we should also be working with the community to ensure that the zoning is most appropriate for those parcels. So we will be working with the community to ensure that the appropriate level of intensity is placed on a piece of property. So the category is just the first step. It's the labeling of property. Ultimately, there still has to be a zoning process that determines what can actually go on the ground. So in the instance, let's say, of a residential area that is categorized as medium density residential, um, if there are single family residences uh, throughout that block, typically we would categorize it at the, le at the least amount of, of density that, that would be appropriate within that category. I mean, we, we would certainly work with the neighborhoods to make sure that that is part of, part of the process. Well, if there are single family and duplexes, then does it become more of a, a mid density area then? And, and uh, there was a potential for that. I think that, um, again, neighborhoods and communities are, uh, as part of the process, are case by case. Um, there are also other categories. It doesn't necessarily have to be a medium density residential category. In an instance like that, where there's a mixed neighborhood that has um, duplexes, triplexes, and single family right. residences, we also have proposed the urban low density residential category, which is a new category that uh, has precedent in San Antonio. There are uh, currently plans within the community that have that category listed within them. So with the uh, adopted staff proposal, that uh, category would be available, and we could use it in an instance like that potentially. And would that also mean that a neighborhood might uh, re request to be labeled an urban low density or something? Sure. We would, as, as we go through the community planning process, there is the opportunity for a neighborhood to, uh, to work with us to categorize them a number, of different, a number of different ways. It doesn't have to be low density, urban low density, medium density. And then there's also nuance that can be provided within that too. We could categorize neighborhoods based on that input that we get from them because they're the ones that live there. Um, if they believe this sector of our neighborhood really could see additional density and could accommodate more, provided it was done in a certain way, we could categorize it one way, whereas the balance of that neighborhood could be categorized a different way. So all of that is part of that community planning process and having those sit-down meetings. And, and I think that the, the, uh, the speaker uh, said it pointedly. Uh, it is a very arduous process, but it is one of those processes that we want to make sure that folks are at the table, that we have those very detailed meetings to ultimately go almost block by block in certain instances to make sure that we're getting it right. Yeah. I, I realize in a lot of the communities we've heard from, and I received the letters and, and looked the, at these over, they're in areas that because we haven't had these kinds of new restrictions that are proposed, the, the new guidelines, that a lot of multifamily properties have already been developed in single-family residences, mm -hmm. which kind of already opens the door uh, to enable MF33s to pop up in these neighborhoods without any, any real mechanism to stop them because some of them have already been put there. Um, do you think that if MF33 was removed from these medium uh, density areas, that would create a, a greater uh, barrier for the continuing development of, of similar types of properties in those neighborhoods? Um, I wouldn't think so, Councilman, um, given the fact that if an MF33 property was being developed utilizing the current zoning, the zoning would still remain. 
at the end of the day, we would, we would still have to work with the community to develop the appropriate land use plan. So if the community says, we have a neighborhood, and we do have certain instances of this, we actually just had a meeting with the West Side Neighborhoods, uh, the, the West Side Neighborhoods Coalition. And part of the discussion that occurred at that meeting was, um, there is a sector plan out in that community for a portion of the West Side community plan that uh, recommends uh, the urban tier or the suburban tier land use category, which allows, uh, according to the land use palette, allows up to MF33 density. That community has expressed numerous times that they want a lower density community. And so part of our process has to be looking at the, at the current uses that are on the ground, looking at the current zoning, ad adjusting the land use plan accordingly, and then following it up with a zoning process. We can adopt a land use plan for an area, but if we don't address it with zoning, then the, um, the entitlement is still on the ground for somebody to still put an MF33 property. So the, the land use categories, the recommended zoning allowances that are within those categories are one small piece of, of a much greater process that has to occur in order for us to, to conserve the, the neighborhood character. Can there be uh, modifications to MF33 that would say they can only be developed on arterial streets rather than, you know, central uh, neighborhood streets? Um, there can always be amendments to zoning districts through the standard amendment process. So if we find that MF33 has challenges that need to be addressed and maybe there's some locational criteria or so forth that may need to be considered, that would be done typically through the UDC amendment process. Um, if that is a concern, that is something that the, that the planning department uh, can collaborate with development services on to explore and at least look at that district and see, is it being abused in some way? Um, is there some sort of reform that would need to occur for, the, for that district? And then we, we, could amend, uh, we could make some recommended amendments and we can bring those forward uh, as part of the 2020 amendment process. Could you amend uh, MF33s to be no greater than three stories? Yes, sir. That, that, that could be uh, part of a potential amendment package in the, fu in the future if, uh, following exploration and so forth. Okay. Thank you. I have no other yes, questions. Sir. Councilman Brockhouse. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate your time. You're doing very well. Oh, thank you. A resident actually just texted me right now and sent me these very kind words. Of mine. <laughs> said, uh, I guess they're watching because it's a Thursday, and what better things you have to do than watch a city council meeting? He's articulate and concise, but pleasant. That's <laughs> what they said about you. <laughs> I have to agree. You are <laughs> you're very pleasant. I you're appreciate making, the, the You're making this very <laughs> exciting, this, this wonderful topic. Uh, I just wanted to... Uh, just real quick, I mean, I'm in support of uh, the overall piece, um, but on this particular amendment, I uh, will not be supporting it. I, I think that uh, I'm not unsympathetic to the needs of uh, neighborhoods. You know, specifically, I think about my time back in serving District 1 uh, and Beacon Hill and those neighborhoods, and, and they, we got to find the answer for it. I, I just don't know what it is. The MF33 designation is, is good for District 6 and some of the things we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and then in the expanding opportunities with development, uh, with what we're trying to do with incentivizing housing and growth and all that, you know, I'm fully on board with uh, that opportunity being available. But, you know, we're going to have to answer that question a lot sooner rather than later about uh, protecting uh, areas and communities like Beacon Hill, right, which are on the cusp of downtown. They're not quite, you know, and, and their properties are going to get picked up and building is coming and, and they're, they want to keep hold of their culture and their community uh, and they don't want... Um, too much growth, but they want enough to bring in the younger population and to keep their neighborhood living and vibrant for years and decades to come. So we have, we have to find the answer. Um, and the fact that, now frankly, that you brought it up at the end of the process, that doesn't bother me at all. I mean, I, you got a job to do and you're representing your, your district and your community. And uh, if somebody in my community brought it to me the last couple of days said, hey man, I need you to go fight for this and it makes sense and it's representative of District 1 or District 7, I mean, you put it up there and we take a vote on it and it is where it is, but I'd like to get, when, when this is done from a, this vote today on this piece, when it's finished, we, we need to continue that conversation about, um, you know, saving communities. Because someday in the future, who knows how long, District 6 is going to be the District 1. And we're just going to be having the same conversation about my community 30, 25, 30 years down the road when we're encased by development and building and then the other communities outside want the higher, you know, the higher density, the bigger zoning opportunities and the bigger development opportunities and we're going to be struggling as the inner city portion, right? Sooner or later, six, anything in, inside 1604 is going to be the, today's inside 410. So, you know, we got to get there and get that answer done quickly. 
um, again, not unsympathetic at all to the goals of protecting neighborhoods and making sure, but overall, I think it's a good first step, but I'd like to as quickly as possible get around to those answers because as we incentivize this growth and, and, and do these things, uh, neighborhoods and their identity are going to get uh, the, are usually the first thing up on the chopping block uh, when it comes to development, which I, I want to pursue everywhere we can in the city in the context of what is best for that neighborhood and community. And in that case, that's what council members, uh, my colleagues, uh, Councilman Trevino, Councilwoman Sandoval are attempting to do today. So uh, right conversation, I think, to have, uh, but in this particular, just not the right time. But I want to get it done as soon as we can after this vote. But I'm appreciative of the staff work, and, and I'll be supporting the recommendation today. Thank you. And we look forward to having that discussion with the council. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Brockhouse. Councilwoman Sandoval. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I seconded this motion because I believe the councilman brought forward some good points and that they were worthy of a discussion before we moved forward on this. Um, I, uh, I think the changes, you know, we were talking yesterday about a historic agreement on the, on the Alamo, and, and I think this is historic too, so uh, we want to be very thoughtful as we move forward. Um, you know, the more you work on something, sometimes the more things you find, the more you learn as you're going along and you want to keep uh, improving it. Um, but unfortunately, at some point, we, we do have to make a decision, right, in, in, in order to, to get going. Um, but nonetheless, I do think this is worthy of, of the discussion, so I'm, I'm glad that we're having it right now. Um, I do want to, I guess I need some clarification here. Uh, what the councilman uh, had discussed was, what density are we seeing, will we be seeing under this plan along the major corridors? Um, I, I think it's to, to best answer the question, it, would, it really depends because corridors, just like neighborhoods and, and various other areas of our city, they're also different. Um, corridors tend to have almost character areas and, and just for the sake of the conversation, I'll use Bandera Road. There are a oh, number, of course, <laughs> yes ma'am. Uh, there are a significant number of, of parcels along Bandera Road that ultimately have created several different character types within the community. So mm -hmm. um, there are some corridors that would be like an urban mixed use type density. If there is the opportunity for you to leverage transit investments that, that are in the area, if we can make um, Im improvements to uh, walkability and the appropriate level of, of infrastructure, other types of infrastructure improvements. There could be, you know, an agglomeration of, of density along with neighborhood serving uses and so forth. But then we also have other areas like San Pedro Road in District 1, where there is a significant amount, even though it's a major corridor, of uh, lined with single family residences. So the character along that corridor would be very different as well. So I think that um, it's incumbent upon the planning department when we work with the community to to be sensitive to that, to the idea that, that no corridor is alike, no neighborhood is alike, the circumstances are very different, and that's the reason why uh, the comprehensive plan recommended that we're not moving forward with sub-area plans, you know, whether they be regional center or community plans or corridor plans, that recommend a blanket type of land use for any one area. We have to have a map and we have to have policies that are localized to that specific area. So in terms of um, the, the councilman is proposing to have a land use category that's mixed use, MF uh, 25, um, that would be applicable along the high capacity transit corridors. Are you telling me that's not possible with the current staff recommendation? Uh, what I, with the current staff recommendation, we have proposed up to MF 18 within the neighborhood mixed use category, which is where the councilman has recommended adding the MF 25. Um, so, Given the fact that we would like, as the planning department, at least our proposal to the council would be uh, to continue to be faithful to the public engagement that we have had. And so we want to be sure that we have proposed to the community since the beginning that MF-18 would be the highest level of density in, a, in that particular category. So we're proposing that today. At, uh, towards the, you know, at the end of this process, it would be council's discretion if you believe that it would be most appropriate to have the 25 district within that category. Sorry, you promised that MF-18 would be the highest density they would see along? Within that land use category, not necessarily specifically. Where, but within where, a, ca a Within the category. Use. The application would come during the, category, the community planning process. Sorry, and just state again which category? Uh, that is the neighborhood mixed use category, is what I believe I, I heard. Right, right, okay. So, sorry, I don't understand why the density, why you would recommend a lower density mm -hmm 
uh, for mixed use than just uh, non-mixed use? Um, when it comes to the neighborhood mm -hmm. scaled mixed use category, we have had a number of conversations with various community uh, stakeholders, um, and there has been this conversation, some, some level of consternation related to density. And the neighborhood scaled mixed use category being most appropriate adjacent to, to neighborhoods, where neighborhoods have the opportunity to access the goods and services that that category would provide. Additionally, that category would also provide opportunity if somebody wanted to, let's say, live uh, in the place of uh, where they're conducting their retail or conducting their service use, if they wanted to have apartments upstairs or condominiums upstairs or somewhere within that facility, then the category would allow that flexibility as well. So given the fact that that category and the text within the category describing it says that it would be adjacent to residential neighborhoods, there was a discussion with the community about what level of density would be most appropriate there, what level of density would the community be willing to tolerate if we're creating this, this category at all. This is a new category. Okay, so they would be willing to tolerate up to that density adjacent, but it sounds like you believe they're willing to tolerate an even higher density within the neighborhood. Not necessarily. Again, it depends on how the community moves forward through the planning process in determining what, de what appropriate category should be within a particular community. Um, the example that I gave earlier about um, a neighborhood that may believe that there is a, a small pocket where additional density could be appropriate, the planning department, of course, is willing to consider that discussion with the community if the community feels that a center neighborhood uh, collective of parcels would be appropriate for higher density. Um, but I wouldn't want to completely just say that that would apply across the board. Okay. <clears throat> um, these are, this is a complicated change. It's not, I, I don't believe it's, it's straightforward, so I'm still uh, processing mm -hmm. that. I, I do have a, a couple of questions. Because this is so complicated, <clears throat> can you explain to me, Rudy, why are we seeing this on the dais? The councilman mentioned that that was the direction you gave him as opposed to integrating or discussing it as, as a staff recommendation? Um, the councilman had re, is making these amendments, the MF25 in the neighborhood mixed use and the MF33 in the, the removal of the MF33 from the medium density residential is a, is a request that Councilman Trevino is making to the council. It is not part of staff's recommendation, so it would have to be a, an, an amendment that the council would make. So, um, so basically, staff is not rec would have recommended against it, even if this came up two months ago. Um, because it has not been part of our community outreach, um, the proposal that you have in front of you is the one that we are advocating for today. Yes, ma'am. And um, can you uh, explain again? I'm just trying to understand the the, the sure. process here. Um, so here we are at, at council voting on something extremely significant. <laughs> um, was this discussed at, when was the last time this was discussed at committee, the committee dedicated to the comprehensive planning process? Uh, the comprehensive planning committee met on June 20th, mm -hmm. which is at the, because the, the city council, they, they, rec they heard a briefing on the 20th. Uh, the city council here considered it on the 21st and asked that it be remanded back to the comprehensive planning committee. At the Comprehensive Planning Committee over the summer, it was determined that it, we, they would like to see one more round of community engagement meetings that were going to be conducted by the American Institute of Architects chapter locally. Mm -hmm. And so following that, it was also determined at the CPC that we should bring it back on this date. Okay, so CPC said we do not want to see any revisions that occur after AIA, basically. The CPC did not suggest for or against any, any revisions at that time. No motion was made related to revisions at the CPC. But they, they basically said, we are okay with whatever happens. It does not need to come back to the CPC. They, they didn't request they to see any changes correct. after they that round of engagement. Correct, ma'am. They forwarded it to the city council at that meeting. Okay. Um, so I just, thank you for explaining that yes, process to me. It, it helps me um, sort of put the pieces together, how, how we ended up here today. Um, I do want to make just a, a, a comment, and um, this is, so we have a process at City Hall, um, and I, I think it's a great process that, that the city manager started. Uh, it's called a high-profile solicitation for, for contracts, right? Things that are extremely controversial that we want to have above board. There is, there is a very clear process about how that's going to happen. I think we need to consider starting to do that for high-profile policy. That we, that we bring forward because 
you know, even back on June 21st, and this is no attack on you <laughs> at all. Understood, it's, it's, I'm just bringing up a, a, a discussion item. Even back on June 21st, I think there was um, some uncertainty about, well, what's the appropriate way to do the outreach when we have a major change coming to council, but we didn't take it back to the stakeholders. And uh, I put forward a CCR called Advancing Public Participation. And thank you, Rudy, you and your team have taken notice and you're starting to integrate uh, some of the recommendations in there. I really appreciate that. But I, I just want to throw it out there to my colleagues that I think we do need to start thinking about when we have a high profile policy item, what are, what are gonna be our standards? What are gonna be our expectations that the public can, can expect from us that you know, when we're gonna go to them, when we're gonna go to committee, all, all that stuff. Um, so thank you very much for, for answering those questions. I appreciate it, Rudy. Yes, ma'am, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman Sandoval. Councilman Pelayas. Thank you. There's, a, there's an old cowboy saying that says, if you don't know where you're going, you best not put on your spurs. <laughs> um, and to be honest with you, I have no idea what I'm going to do here. Uh, but <laughs> uh, but I, what I do think is I haven't heard enough and I've heard a lot of really good points, and, and I'm just curious if Mr. Trevino has any good answers to this, because I, I, I'm really curious to hear what you've got to say. And so now that I've chimed in, Mayor, I kind of regret it. <laughs> and I'd like to hear what, what Councilman Trevino has to say. Thanks, Mayor. I'm sorry, Councilman, are you yielding the floor to Councilman Trevino? All right, we have other members of council in the queue. Uh, if we can. Well, actually, just one, and then we'll go back to Councilman Trevino, if that's okay. All right, Councilman Shaw. Thanks, Mayor. Um, you don't have to say anything. I got it. Um, <laughs> I had my questions. You answered all my questions days before today. So thank you for, to you and your team. Um, I also understand the concerns of, of Councilman Trevino, and I'm sure we can address those concerns as we move forward. But um, as I've discussed with him, as well as my colleagues, I will be uh, supporting the recommendation of staff and can, looking forward to continued conversation regarding the amendments. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Shaw. Councilman Trevino. Thank you, Mayor. And I just, I guess I have to address something that I, I kept coming up because it, it feels like uh, we're, we're talking about two separate things now. And um, you made a great point, Mayor, when you said let's keep it pertinent to the amendments that I made. And what, what I think is being suggested is that again, that, that uh, this just came up. So, Rudy, I would ask you, did this just come up? In terms of the full package of amendments? I'm, no, I'm talking from me, did, from my office, and, and working with you mm -hmm. in the planning department. Did this just come up? I, again, in terms of both of these amendments, we just heard about them on Monday. The MF33, yes, has been part of a long-standing conversation with your office and also with, with a number of neighborhoods. Thank yes, you. sir, I did see that. And I think um, the, the neighborhood mixed use recommendation that was something that we're just hearing Thank about. You. Yes, sir. So, I mean, that, that's, that's key. That's critical because, I mean, first of all, I mean, I appreciate some of the comments and, and, and I certainly want, uh, want to be a proponent of process and process is important. We, we want to have a robust uh, community discussion. We want to uh, be as engaged as we can with our residents. Uh, point in fact, this, this plan is for the residents. And, and so we have been bringing this issue up since day one. Um, I want to be clear that if, if my council colleagues are confused, it, it, it almost feels like it's by design. And, and, then, and to, to suggest this is just something that just came up is, is something that I take exception to. Um, so I just want to point that out. You can disagree with me, and I think we're okay. I mean, that's why we're up here, to, to discuss policy, and we want, to, we want to be clear about what we're talking about today. So I agree with the mayor. We're, let's talk about these amendments. Let's talk about what they mean. But I take exception with anybody suggesting that I just brought this up. I want to be clear about that. This is about neighborhoods. This is about the character. This is about neighborhood plans. They keep saying this over and over again. I, I, I'm confused about why this is even being said at all. I'm sorry I've confused some of my colleagues. Uh, you know, I don't mean to. Uh, but uh, I look forward to working with each and every one of you to try to uh, help clarify some of this. Uh, I, take, I take this role very seriously, and, I, and I'll tell you, every one of my staff people 
especially Chrissy, has been working uh, diligently on this for quite a long time, and I know it's a lot of work, and I respect the work that goes into uh, these, these kinds of projects. Um, but Chrissy has worked with uh, other council staffs. We, we've brought this issue up. We will continue to bring this issue up, and I will continue to advocate for, for what I have experienced and what, what my district has experienced as incompatible development. And we're just trying to find a way forward. So I ask for that consideration. I realize that, that there is uh, a lot of confusion, but uh, let's, I, I can only hope that we continue to have more discussions uh, on such an important topic. And I think this is one of the most important issues my district is facing. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Trevino. And, and first of all, I appreciate all the conversations. Um, so let me just say first that I'm not confused. In fact, um, for those of us, most of us actually, who, who have been up here working on SA Tomorrow, even as, as pr prior to coming on council, could see this train coming a mile away. And that is that the premise of SA Tomorrow and the whole idea of a comprehensive plan was to, number one, accommodate an incredible amount of growth that's happening in our community right now. And the fact that those incompatible developments that are occurring in District 1 are starting to bleed over into every single other district, and they're going to continue to happen. And without a comprehensive plan, it's going to be even worse as we expect new development to arise, particularly as we're getting to some really serious policy um, discussions and resolving an imbalance in housing that's occurred, there's going to be way more development, good quality development, that we hope uh, addresses a drastic need in housing that our city has currently today. And if we don't have rules of the road, if we don't have a comprehensive coordinated land use plan, the, the problems that are occurring in District 1 and the reasons that Tier 1 got together as a coalition will only continue to get worse. So let me first, um, let me say in addition to that, I appreciate everything that Councilman Trevino uh, has been doing. Um, the Tier 1 neighborhoods, the coalition, has a seat at the table because of Councilman Trevino. Um, and, the, and the feedback that we've gotten during those meetings and the intense discussions that have happened have not gone on deaf ears. In fact, I've seen a lot of changes uh, in my time working on SA Tomorrow uh, on these very land use categories. I'll also say uh, I take my previous role as a District 8 City Council member pretty seriously in this discussion as well because Ross Lawhead has been a frequenter in City Council chambers to make sure that neighborhoods have plans and that they're protected in the future. So let me clarify one point, and this was true in the preamble of SA Tomorrow. When we're creating new land use plans, when we're def resolving some of the land use category um, contradictions, one of the premises is we're doing that to protect the, the integrity of neighborhoods. So I want to make sure that we don't lose the tools that we have available as single member district representatives to make changes uh, to land use categories, zoning categories, zoning districts, when we see that this map that we've applied to the city of San Antonio doesn't work right in this one instance. Um, nobody likes to say down zoning in this chamber, but it's true. We might have to down zone a few places if it looks like it's incompatible. And that's the reality. And it takes a bit of fortitude to do it, but we're going to do it, and we've done it before. But the truth of the matter is we have to arrive at a point, I think, with this land use categories that makes the most sense for the most number of people in the most neighborhoods, and our constituents have to do their jobs in making sure they elect people who respond to the neighborhood concerns. And that's not just true when we're defining what the land use categories are today, um, but that's true in the future. Um, so with regard to the amendments, there, is, there are a couple of fundamental realizations about our community that happened about four years ago um, during SA Tomorrow. One of them is that we agree that we need to densify certain areas of town. That's the reality. We want to make sure that we allow for higher density, easier high density 
development to occur where it's compatible. Where it's not compatible, we need to do our jobs to protect those neighborhoods. Ross's neighborhood plan in Oakland Hay States needs to retain the strength and boundaries of the neighborhood that it currently has today and not be overrun by land use changes in a bigger map. And that's something that I've committed to and I know that Manny has committed to and, and, and future council members will as well. The second uh, issue or second realization through SA Tomorrow is that we don't just have one urban core. We have nine of them. In fact, we're going to have 13 of them when the real population boom occurs. And within those urban cores, that's where we're going to have to focus a lot of resources to build the infrastructure to make those kinds of land use categories beneficial to everyone and also to accommodate the growth and the density that's going to occur so we can protect the neighborhoods. All that being said, I know there's been a tremendous amount of work that's gone into this. I agree with the staff recommendation. I also agree uh, with my colleague that there are some areas where it's just not going to work the way it's intended. And we might have to see some CCRs, or we might have to see some individual action to protect areas that aren't totally compatible. Um, so I just wanted to level set with everyone today that this is no surprise. I also don't have a problem with the process. Um, we might need to see more of these actions on the fly. But it is true that we've gotten to this point. It's not a surprise to anybody. And this is really why we said from the very start of the comprehensive planning process, all that fury over actually passing the plan, finally getting to the point, what was it, two years ago now, to pass SA tomorrow, that was the easy part. This is where the rubber hits the road. If we're going to have a high quality community, if we're going to have a, a city that can benefit or, or that can guarantee quality of life in every corner of the district, whether you're in Beacon Hill or in any of the other tier one neighborhoods or in Oakland Estates or in a high density area like Southtown, we've got to have a comprehensive plan that works. And we have to be committed in this council and moving forward to make some pretty tough decisions. Um, that starts today, in my opinion. I agree with the councilwoman who said this is kind of historic. It is. Uh, but it also means that starting today, we are committed to working with our neighborhoods to identify the areas where it doesn't make sense and to make changes. As much as we give you headaches, there's more coming, Rudy and Bridget, but we've got to do that in order to execute this plan uh, the way I think our neighborhoods, our constituents, and our council before and after have intended. So I'll be supporting the, the staff recommendation. I, I appreciate the work of Councilman Trevino and his office um, and Councilwoman Sandoval as well, who um, actually has Tier 1 folks uh, in her office uh, making sure that we're doing this right. Um, so thank you for the work, and uh, I'll be supporting the staff recommendation today. All right. There are no other... Uh, well, yeah. Councilman Flies. I, I hate doing this, because that was really good. Uh, and I, I wish I could... I, I, I want to echo... To one thing, and then I want to ask a question. Um, it, I will fight you tooth and nail if we, if I ever see that we are doing anything to imperil these neighborhood plans. You know, we have limit. You know, we, the city of San Antonio, have limitless resources. They don't, right? And the amount of work that they've put into protecting the character of their neighborhoods is huge and they've done it despite the fact that they got day jobs and families to take care of and you know Ross is doing this pro bono uh, and so word of warning you know I, I'll be the first to scream and yell at you uh, you know if I ever see anything that even comes close to that thanks Ross for coming out uh, with regards to uh, Co Councilman Trevino um, I'm still I'm, I'm still confused I hate telling you that uh, and so what it, I walked in here today wanting to make, you know, two amendments as well. I'm, I've taken mine back just to kind of think about them a little bit more. The commitment I make to you is I still want to take a stab at making some minor tweaks on my end as well, um, and I'll, I'll be happy to work with you on yours. And, um, you know, the best way that, to find out if you can trust me on that is to trust me on that. Uh, and so, um, but that's my comment. Thank you, man.
Thank you, Councilman Pelias. Okay, so there are two motions on the floor. Uh, we'll take up the secondary motion first, which is uh, the, mo the, mo the amendment offered by Councilman Trevino, seconded by Councilwoman Sandoval. So this is uh, the amendment offered by Councilman Trevino. Please vote. Motion fails. Now we'll move now to the primary motion, which is the uh, motion made by Councilman Villagran for item 15. Please vote. Motion carries. All right. Thank you again, everyone, for coming out. And, and this, uh, this episode of SA Tomorrow will continue to the next edition. Um, item number 20. Item number 20 is a resolution initiating his